UFC 289, Amanda Nunes versus Irina Aldana. We have a big card coming up this Saturday in Vancouver, Canada. A lot of good fights on this one. Only 11 fights total, so a little more concise, but I don't even hate that. Sometimes these events take too long. I don't know if anyone caught the PFL event uh, from this week, Thursday, but that thing probably took like 12 hours total. So sometimes less can be more, but I will be going through all of these fights, breaking down each of the matchups and providing our, my picks for each of them. Uh, this is just my opinion, but uh, we've been doing pretty well lately so we're gonna try and keep that mo momentum here and our first fight we are going through is diana Belbita versus marina Oliveira. this is a fight taking place in the strawweight division diana Belbita is one in three in the ufc maria Oliveira is one in two we got even odds in this one, so Vegas doesn't really know what to do with this, and neither do I, really. Uh, Belbita has pretty good cardio, and she's really gritty. Um, fights from uh, the, the start to all the way through the end, she's giving 100% effort the whole time. So uh, her key to winning this matchup is going to be just out striking her opponent, Maria Oliveira. Oliveira, on the other hand, she throws a lot of kicks, flying knees, a lot of big movements. DC, that's one of his uh, catchphrases. He loves saying that. Uh, we, we see a lot of those from Oliveira. She's a little bit flashier, but she leaves herself exposed a lot. Her hands are pretty low, and she's gotten caught um, slacking defensively a few times. I think Oliveira is the faster fighter and the more powerful, but I think that gas tank of Belbita is going to overwhelm Oliveira, and uh, she's just going to strike her way to a decision win here. Um, Belbita mixes up her strikes very well. She attacks the body, she attacks the legs, whereas Oliveira is usually just going for um, more one-dimensional with, with her head strikes. So. Uh, that will benefit Belbita in this one. Belbita by decision is the pick. Next up is a flyweight fight. David Zvorak versus a UFC newcomer, Steve Esrig, Ersig. David Zvorak is three and two in the UFC. Started out on a, or he's three and two in his last fight, last five in the UFC. Started, uh, had a three fight win streak going. Uh, in the UFC, then lost two in a row to Mateus Nicolau and Manel Kopp. Urseg is 9-2 in his career um, with a notable win over Shannon Ross. Uh, notable as in that's the only name I think anyone really recognized um, since he spent his pretty much his whole career fighting guys on the local Australian scene. But he is on a bit of a uh, tear himself won the belts in uh, that uh, the Australian promotion he was previously in, like Eternal and MMA, I believe it was called. Um, I could be getting that wrong, but it's it's uh, it's a regional, in, in the regional scene, nonetheless. Uh, Dvorak, coming off of that loss to Manel Cop, where he got beat to hell, um, really on the feet, was getting pummeled, and then he in the second round, almost had his shoulder ripped out of his, its socket entirely. He, you could tell he was uh, hurt from that from that fight. Um, didn't really throw that his left arm that got cranked on the rest of the fight, uh, and that's sort of making me question where he's at. Only six months later, um, six months is a significant amount of time, and I don't think there's any indication that he had a major injury. But I think it's certainly something to think about. Urseg, on the other hand, um, has some momentum going into this fight. Uh, he's a decent counter puncher and has good grappling. Uh, he's got several submission finishes, and I think his grappling can um, somewhat at least uh, cancel out that of Jvorak's. I think a lot of the grappling exchange exchanges are going to depend on what takes place on the feet, who can stun the other guy first. Um, 
Dvorak is the major favorite in this one at minus 320. And I'm liking the value we're getting from Steve Urseg at almost 3-1 to one underdog. So Urseg is the pick in this fight. I think he can find a way to get a decision win in this fight uh, and really start his UFC career on a positive note. Um, probably taking David Dvorak out of the top 15 rankings if that happens. Next up, we have a uh, featherweight fight. Our first Canadian of the card, Kyle Nelson. Um, and he is taking on a UFC uh, new uh, relative newcomer, Blake Builder. He's 1-0 in the UFC and has a win in the Contender Series. Kyle Nelson is the plus 200 underdog in this one. He is 1-3-1 in his last five fights. He pretty much got gifted a draw versus Dohu Choi in their most recent fight. He was getting pretty much beaten all aspect, aspects of that fight versus Dohu Choi, um, which Dohu Choi is certainly not no slouch. And Kyle Nelson really has been in there with some of the toughest guys in the division, Jai Herbert, uh, Billy Quarantino. These are not nobodies that he's been facing. So he's had a really tough run of guys he's coming up against. Builder is um, a guy who's very explosive. You can just take a look at him and how he throws uh, to tell that he has the power to put people away with his hands. He has a golden glove background, but despite that, likes to shoot for takedowns. I think... Uh, this fight is going to be largely up to Blake Builder to fight at a healthy pace, not overcommit on takedowns and, and keep the fight standing. I think it's his key to winning this. He likes to wrestle, but I think that plays into Kyle Nelson's hands where he can use his experience grappling against UFC-level opponents to um, to control where the fight go takes place. Kyle Nelson likes to stuff people up against the cage and do his work from there. So Builder's going to have to be uh, ready for that. I think he will be ready for that, however. And the big thing in this fight for me is that Builder really only needs to land one shot to put Nelson away um, with his power and just what we've seen from Nelson uh, getting rocked in previous fights. So this is going to be a really tough matchup for Builder, but I think he passes the test in this one. And I think he gets a KO victory. Next is a bantamweight fight between Ayman Zahabi, brother of Faraz Zahabi. A little background. He was uh, George St. Pierre's coach, most notably, in Canada. So he, this this is one of the bigger names in Canadian MMA, the Zahabi family. His opponent is Arochi Lang, um, the... Mongolian nightmare, some type of nickname they gave him. Uh, he is two and two in the UFC. Is Orochi Lang? Zahabi is three and two with notable wins over Ricky Turkios and uh, Draco Dracar Close. Uh, Draco Rodriguez, but uh, pardon me. Um, Zahabi is a very accurate striker. He focuses more on well-placed shots versus output, where Orochi Lang, on the other hand, is trying to put a lot on you, overwhelm you with volume, and I would give Orochi Lang the uh, edge and power between these two striking. And I think this fight's gonna be decided in the first round if Zahabi can weather the storm and get Orochi Lang tired. I think Orochi Lang will put himself in a precarious position that Zahabi will be able to take advantage of and find a finish, be it through uh, KO or submission. So Zahabi by finish is the pick in this fight. We have a featherweight women's fight up next between Jasmine Jazdavicius and Miranda Maverick. Jasmine is uh, another a hometown fighter, I believe, from, from Canada. Um, her opponent, Miranda Maverick, is 3-2 and two in her last five fights. She's going to be the minus 300 favorite in this one. Jasmine is sitting at around plus 250, so a lot of value from her. 
Jasmine's coming off of a big win versus uh, Sonia Fernandez, I believe. Very decisive victory. Um, definitely a, impressed everyone who watched her, and she had a lot of doubters going into that fight, just given her relative lack of ex MMA experience, especially when you compare it to her age. She's a bit older in her 30s. Um, despite being older, Miranda Maverick is the one with uh, a greater amount of experience in competitive MMA. She started <clears throat> her career, I think a year or two before Jasmine did. Miranda's a really strong grappler and she's really strong physically too. Uh, uh, she's been able to sort of overpower a lot of her opponents in the past. And I think this fight's gonna be primarily a grappling fight and that should benefit Miranda Maverick in this one. I think she'll just have the slightly better grappling just given her experience advantage, doing it for longer, and um, and I think she'll, she'll be the stronger of the two. So I think Miranda Maverick finds a way to get a submission win here. Final fight of the prelim is Nasruddin Imavov versus uh, Chris Curtis. I'm really excited for this fight. This could have easily made it to the main card. Um, I think these are two of the bigger names you'll find on the card. Imavov is three and two, coming off of a loss where he just got pretty much dominated by Sean Strickland on the feet for 25 minutes. Uh, it was his first 25 minute fight in the UFC and Sean was a, uh, was a, uh, short-term replacement, I believe, in that one. So, and I think Sean's a really tough guy to prepare for to begin with, so him coming in on short notice uh, definitely was tough for Imavov to adjust to. Imavov has notable wins over Joaquin Buckley and Edmund Shabazian. Chris Curtis, on the other hand, is three and two as well. He's gonna be the underdog in this one at plus 125. Um, he's got wins against Buckley as well as Brendan Allen, and his most recent fight was a close loss to Kelvin Gastelum. A very razor close loss to Gastelum. Imavov, uh, he's one of the rare Dagestanis who likes to strike. I believe he trains in Paris. I wouldn't be shocked if he got deported from Dagestan for not really being good at grappling. Um, he's that's just not his game he's gonna stand and strike with you um, he's shown an ability to get top position and like in scrambles but he also has been put on his back a few times in his previous fights but lucky for him he won't have to worry about that in this fight Chris Curtis is gonna want to keep it standing Curtis trains with Sean which I think is gonna benefit him in this one um, he'll sort of be able to get the blueprint from Sean and Although I think Sean is more of the pressure striker between the two, whereas Curtis wants to counter you and lure you in and, uh, you know, lull you to sleep and then put it on you. I still think that that stand-up approach is going to help him in this fight. Imavov is incredibly talented, but uh, he's got that really long torso. I think he's, he's kind of built like the Men in Black aliens like the little in insectoid guys where he's got that long torso. I think Curtis is going to work his body a lot and that'll start to, start to open things up for the rest of his offense. So this is going to be a largely a stand-up affair, but I think Curtis is just going to edge him out. He's got that experience as well. So Curtis, Curtis by decision is the pick here. First fight of the main card is a middleweight fight between Mark Andre Barrialt and Eric Anders. Barrialt is the minus 145 favorite in this one. He is three and two in his last five fights uh, with a notable win over Julian Marquez and losses versus Hernandez and Chitty. Eric Anders is two and three in his last five last five fights. He's got a win over Kyle Dawkins and losses to Andre Muniz and Jun Young Park. He's sitting at around plus 125 in this one. 
Eric Anders is a really athletic guy, and I think I'm just going to switch between saying Anders and Anders, so ignore that. He's an athletic guy. He played uh, uh, played football at Alabama, so you know that he's uh, athletic, strong. Barrios, on the other hand, is really physically strong as well, though possibly not quite as explosive. Um, but I think Barrios just has the edge and just violence factor, where he's always going for the finish from every punch he throws. And I don't think Anders has the um, has the dexterity and evasiveness to avoid the onslaught of Barrios. Um, and I think it won't be long before Eric Anders gets hurt. I mean, if you just go back and rewatch the Barry Alt fight versus Julian Marquez, the amount of damage that he inflicted in such little time. I mean, Marquez's face was like a different color by the end of the fight. So Mark Andre just put it puts it on you, and I think he'll be able to do the same in this fight. Um, but this is certainly a close one where, when you have two guys who are as explosive as as these guys are, I mean, it, it all it really takes is one punch. So anything can really happen in that one. We have a featherweight fight uh, after that between Dan Ige and Nate the Train Landwehr. Ige is two and three in his last five fights. He's got a notable win over Damon Jackson most recently and losses versus Josh Emmett and uh, Ivloyev and Korean Zombie. Nate Landwehr is 4-1 and one in his last five with wins over uh, David Onama and Ludovic Klein. Despite having the better record as of late, Dan Ige is the heavy favorite in this one at minus 250. Uh, you can get Nate at 2-1 odds. This is largely because Ige has been really fighting the, some of the best guys in the division. Josh Emmett, with, even with his flaws, he's a recent title contender. Um, Ivloyev, undefeated guy who's just a tough puzzle to solve for anyone. That No one's really found a way to figure that guy out. Danny Gay is a super powerful striker. He His most recent knockout of David Jackson proved that, where he had a strong left hook that just put Jackson out immediately. Nate Lamer, on the other hand, is about as electric as it gets in, in the UFC. The guy's just so much fun to watch. He's a total showman. He's letting guys up rather than just laying on top of them. He has them hurt. He's, you know, he's shouting to the crowd. I think the Canadian crowd is going to absolutely love this guy. Uh, I just don't know if this is the best matchup for Nate the Train. Um, if it gets into a brawl, obviously anything can happen. Uh, and I think that's kind of where Nate wants to operate. He wants things to get dirty. But if it's a more cleaning, more clean striking affair, um, I give Danny Gay the edge just with his power. And Nate has been caught several times in the first round of his last few fights. So I think Ige uh, getting a round one KO is very live in this matchup. Um, that being said, if... Nate can survive past the first round. The guy is just a hustle monster, does not get tired. Um, so things could really get interesting, potential live betting opportunities in that one. If, if this one's going into the third and things are tied up, uh, then it's really going to be anyone's fight. Um, so Ige by round one KO is the official prediction, but I'll throw that little asterisk uh, just, just in case you know it goes past round one then things could definitely start heating up in that fight. Next is a welterweight fight between Mike Mallett. He's a guy who uh, it really feels like the UFC is trying to prop up. He's kind of feels like the, the, the pride of Canada right now. Certainly his opponent is Adam Fugit in this one. Mallott is 2-0 in the UFC with wins over Mickey Gall and Lion Essie, most recent sub for Lion Essie, and his Mickey Gall victory was a KO. Adam Fugit is one and one. He just beat uh, Kenoshida, uh, and I think that was the South Korea card, I almost want to say, um, or the card with all the all the Asian opponents on it. 
where they were showcasing like Asian fighters. And he also has a loss to um, Morales, who is a guy who the UFC is uh, really been excited about. He's an undefeated guy. So it's not like Fugit's been fighting slouches in there. He's got a 9-3 record, but I think he's a lot better than that record ind indicates. A lot, on the other hand, this guy has never gone to a decision in his career. Every single fight he's been in has been a finish. Um... He has been in trouble in a few of his fights, but Malat just finds a way to get the win. So while people might try and take away from him with that fact that he gets hurt, I think it's also can be looked at as a positive. This guy just, he knows how to overcome adversity. He knows how to stay composed uh, even if he gets hurt. And I think he, he'll get the finish in this fight. If Mike Malat wins, it will be by finish. You can, I, I'll guarantee that right now. So I think he gets a KO win um, pro probably later on in the fight because Fugit, Fugit can take a punch like nobody. So, But a round three KO is the official prediction. Our co-main event, um, a fight which I'd say most MMA fans are maybe more excited about this one than the main event not even taking anything away from Amanda Nunes and Irene, but this is just a super highly anticipated fight between Charles Oliveira and Benil Dariush. Uh, this fight certainly feels like a lightweight uh, title eliminator bout, at least for Benil Dariush. Oliveira, things could get interesting if he wins, but Oliveira, four and one in his last five, obviously most recent loss being to the champ Islam Mahachev. Uh, Oliveira before that loss was arguably the hottest fighter in the UFC. He just could not lose. Neil Dariush, on the other hand, he's riding an eight fight win streak going into this. And that is the reason why he's gonna be the minus 145 favorite in this one. Uh, Oliveira, definitely not his first time being a betting underdog. He was the underdog versus uh, Makachev as well. And seeing Oliveira plus money is just very intriguing, obviously, as it, uh, just knowing how dangerous he is. Most prolific finisher in UFC history is Charles Oliveira. Um, but that being said, I'd say Oliveira between these two probably has the crisper striking um grappling i would say is a toss-up this is going to be the first guy Oliveira has one of the first guys i mean makachev you could obviously argue as well but he's one of the rare guys who can match up with Oliveira in grappling and especially purely in um jiu-jitsu as well darius he's a jiu-jitsu world champion um <clears throat> he's got a lot of power in his hands as well. He had an incredibly impressive win over Mateus Gamrot most recently. A lot of people wrote him off in that one, but he won practically every single wrestling scramble they had, um, thwarted every single takedown, which Mateus is just like obnoxious with that shit. He just shoots, 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 shoots. Oliveira stopped all of them, and then he landed one of the hardest overhand rights or lefts you know you'll ever see in the UFC it just feels to me like this is Benny's time to be honest he's a guy who probably earned a title shot going before this fight um but the UFC is just ma makes him prove it more than anyone else he took a chance taking up the taking on the lower ranked prospect in Gamrot pass the flying colors um, people try to say this guy's boring. I think that is the biggest BS ever. He's had some of the craziest finishes. He's got the spinning back fist KO. The guy's electric, if you ask me, in the cage. Outside of the cage, more composed demeanor. Um, I can see how he doesn't grab your attention as much as some of the other uh, higher-ranked guys in the divi lightweight division. But... Man, Darius versus Makachev would be a sick matchup just to see how Islam uh, 
handles the jiu-jitsu of Darius just to see how that would change up his game plan. I think Darius is one of the best uh, matchups for Islam, certainly in the division, uh, outside of Saruk. And I think Saruk, that, that fight seems destined, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, Oliveira, I think he had his time and a loss here. I certainly wouldn't write him off from championship contention just because of another loss two in a row. He's a guy who I think can climb his way back in this, but Dariush, uh, it really feels like it, it, he's just too hot right now. He's, he's on fire. I think he finds a way to win this fight. Um, Dariush by decision is going to be the pick. Crazy, I know. I don't know if I see Oliveira getting finished two fights in a row. That's really my only hesitation there. And I think Dariush is going to be a bit careful of Oliveira, just knowing how explosive and how Oliveira can change a fight in a heartbeat. So that might make him a little bit more tentative to chase a finish. So Dariush, by decision, is the pick here. Um, that fight's going to be sick. Main event, however, we head to the women's bantamweight division for a fight between Amanda Nunes and Irene Aldana. Nunes, what's there to say? She's the women's goat of MMA. That is non-negotiable, non-debatable. Valentina had a chance. She just lost. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear that Nunes is the greatest woman to, to ever do it in the octagon. She's got wins over Juliana Pena, Megan Anderson, Jermaine Duranami. Um, she did have that loss to Juliana Pena, um, but avenged it immediately after and just demolished uh, uh, Pena. Aldana, on the other hand, she is 4-1 in her last five with wins over Macy Chasson, where she had an upkick liver shot KO. You'll never see that again in the UFC. And uh, win versus Yana Santos. But she did lose to Holly Holm in a, fight, in a uh, main event fight as well. Uh, this is an interesting striking matchup. Uh, Aldana has some of the best hands in women's MMA. Uh, she's a very clean striker. She finds the home for her punches. And she does mix in some kicks, but her bread and butter are, is going to be her boxing. Nunez, on the other hand, is the more powerful striker, I'd say. I, I, she's probably the most powerful women's striker ever in MMA. Um, and just looking at... And also, this is going to be a, a rare bantamweight fight for Aldana. She's usually up a weight class. She struggles getting down to 35, but I watched the, the weigh-in coverage this morning and she made weight but I mean it she looked rough she was like looking ghostly her skin was a different color it was it was a bit concerning so that's certainly a big question mark for Aldana as is her grappling she's even in her most recent fight versus Chasson she got taken down a few times um but she was able to still find a way to get a finish in those fight that fight even when she was taken down. I just don't know if she'll be able to get up if Nunez takes her down and gets like a strong top position on her. I think the big question mark and what people are really talking about a lot is really going to be with Nunez herself, her commitment. Um she was like a recent mother and she, she had a kid shortly before she fought Juliana Pena the first time. And I think everyone sort of saw that she was not as locked in as she usually was. And that led to her losing that fight versus Pena. Um, and then she has some drama over leaving her old team. And it seems like she's really is her own coach right now. And that's another question mark as well. So really this fight, I think it's going to come down to is Nunez going to beat Aldana or is she going to beat herself? Uh, and that's no disrespect to Aldana. That's just me acknowledging that Nunez at her best is the greatest to ever do it. Um, and the question is really going to be, are we going to see her at her best? And I think Nunez is, I mean, she's going to be motivated. This is 
she is the main event. She is the number one fight on this card. Um, I think she's gonna. She knows that she's got a rare opportunity to to capitalize on her popularity here and to build on it with an exciting finish to really set herself up for life changing money down the future. I mean, possibly. It, there aren't the greatest matchups for her because she is just so unrivaled in her division. And especially now that Shevchenko lost, a potential super fight between the two seems less likely as well. But um, nonetheless, Nunes is, does have a unique opportunity to really further stake her claim as the greatest woman to ever do it um, in the UFC, certainly. And... If she comes out locked in, I think she gets a KO in this fight. I think she's just too much for Aldana. Um, certainly Aldana does have the power and the technical ability on the feet to give Nunez a lot of problems. But I think but once Nunez starts mixing in grappling and giving her different looks, uh, I think it's gonna be tough for Aldana to adjust and she's just not quite as well rounded as Nunez is, so Nunez by KO is going to be the pick here. With that, that is my breakdown. Thank you for listening. Uh, let me know your picks below. I keep saying that, um, but I really am interested to hear what everyone thinks of on these fights. Uh, and with that, take care, enjoy the card, and peace.